Um, or you could go to our brand new, thank you, Anton, Breach Editor. Um, and the uh, we'll just give you the maximum flow right here, or you can um, hover over it. These, uh, this is what, I, some, I think Mark was talking about this. This is the new bobber. Um, this is, it used to be that you would click on a point and you would get some information about that point. Now you kind of hover over a point and it'll give you information about the point. Um, one of the things that people aren't totally accustomed to yet is, yeah, but how do I tell the actual like x-axis? Well, if you look down at the x-axis, you'll see that actually we're gonna we're giving you the precise date um, or whatever on any of these .NET plots that are gonna become more and more um, prevalent in RAS. Um, if you wanna know what the, what the X value is, um, you look there. So the max value, you could just kind of hover over this and, uh, and get your max value, um, or we actually will compute it and tell you the time at the max. Now, someone asked, well, what about the time of the breach? Well, I think that we're already in the process of adding that. But how would you find the time of the breach? Well, let's just zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to just kind of hover over. The breach width and velocity are non-zero kind of just after this point. And so that's going to be 04 January 1991 at noon. Um, is when the breach is going to happen. And so how long does it take the breach to fully develop? Well, you, know, you have maximum breach width at um, at two hours. Um, and then and your and then you know, you've got high velocities for some time. All right, so that's how we're going to um, figure that out. A couple of things. Um, let's go to mapper and just get some other some other ideas, other uh, plots here. If we go to Mapper, um, I'm just going to look at some of these results. Um, let's start with this main result. And uh, one of the things that I've added is the current number. I think that like I think that viewing the current number um, in a map form can be really helpful. Um, one of the things that uh, that Mark pointed out is it's sometimes whenever you've got a variable that's plotting on a scale that gets confounded with your terrain, it can be helpful to go and um, do a black and white version of the terrain. And so if you turn off your plot surface, you'll get just the hillshade. So you'll still have the sense of kind of where what your topography is, but now you can see this current plot on top of it. Um, but the current is going from zero to two. You know, we kind of, we see we, we're getting, we're getting some ones in there, but we're not getting much that's above one. Um, we'll zoom out though and go to the actual structure, which is where things are going to get, um, are going to get limiting. And you can see that, oh yeah, we do actually, we do have some currents approaching, approaching two. Um, in that general area. And so then if I, I'm, now I'm gonna come back, I like my terrain, so I'm gonna go back to my terrain and uh, reset the symbology and plot the surface so I can get my terrain back. Um, you can plot the depth or the velocity, but a couple of other things that are useful is the, uh, the arrival time. Um, if you, right click on the result and go to create new result there's a lot of cool things here um depth times the velocity or depth times the velocity squared those are the kinds of variables that fia or um life sim use uh you know one of the one of the rules of thumb you know that uh that i tell my kids and uh that the usgs uses is you don't want the depth times the velocity to be more than more than your height um, because once the depth times the velocity gets to be more than your height it's a pretty good heuristic that things are getting dangerous and so some of the uh some of the life sim stuff does evaluate life risk based on these depth times velocity parameters but then the other really critical parameter that i think is really useful for um dam breach is arrival time because the whole thing about 
um, dam breach is, you know, how how much time are are people going to have, particularly if it happens in the middle of the night, to get warned and get evacuated? Um, and so, you can have you can choose the arrival time to the max, um, which is uh, which is helpful, or you can choose the arrival time um, th when the cell first gets wet, um, and then you can also offset it. So you can offset it because the, the breach doesn't happen right away, right? And so the actual arrival time, um, in this case, because you get flow over the uh, over the spillway that floods a lot of area, um, it's probably wise to just you know do it from when water's going over the uh, over the spillway. But you could go in here and put in the time of breach, and then it'll be the arrival time since from the beginning of the breach. Um, and so I went in and I created an arrival time map. And let me turn off the geometry. And so what you can see here is we've got our, some arrival times in hours from the beginning of the, of the, of the simulation. Um, and as you move downstream, you have more arrival time, you know, in, as much as six hours um, at the downstream reach. And this is to the max water surface. You could also do a very similar map map to the uh, the time to get where the cell first gets wet. But if you've got a large cell that actually has, like for example, if you have a cell that has lots of lots going on in it, and so a cell like you know this actually has some main channel in it and not just the uh, the not just the uh, the floodplain. All right, so those are some uh, those are some things that we can do with the with Mapper. And so then you ran a 500 foot time step or a 500 foot time step. That is uh, that's not something you can do in RAS. That would be clever. Um, you run in a 500 foot grill, grid cell size, and the question was. Is that grid cell sufficient? So let's bring the chat over here. Let's have some uh, some thoughts about that. Um, how did you all feel about your grid cell size at 500 feet? Yeah, it's pretty large. The um, you know the 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 current condition is fine, um, but you know in some of these places you're trying to you're trying to get your entire. Um, yeah, it misses some of the highways. It misses some of the high ground. Um, okay, for a, a rough model, that's that's right. You could definitely get up and running with 500 feet if you want to. If you're in emergency management mode, um, you can definitely get a general sense. Like you could you could create the uh, arrival time map, right? If if your emergency managers wanted that arrival time map, you could get up and running with 500 feet and and just well in. What what you guys just did this in you know ninety minutes or something like that, um, but the uh, but it does miss some a lot of the details and so we also created a two hundred foot and and so how do you know how do you know if five hundred feet is too coarse? Well, the only way to really know is to have it in check, and that's you know if you've taken any numerical methods classes that you know this is what they call the convergence test is any any um, numerical code that you write, um, you're supposed to have the, you know, once you have it running at your, your current condition, you're supposed to have the time step and have the cell size and then run it again and keep converging until it doesn't ch change meaningfully. Now, when in operational modeling, which is what we do, um, you know, it's, it's not that precise, you know, because we want to make sure our run times are usable, um, but it's always, um, preferable to, it's, it's always good practice to have your cell size and your time step and look and see if there are major changes. And if there are, then you need to be kind of cognizant that you're, you're absorbing that error and maybe you need to try to have it again and, and find the place where you're, where you're comfortable with the, the errors. And so how do we know? Well, I've run this um, with a 250 foot cell um, and so I'm going to turn on depth for both of these. And I'm going to go to the max for both. 
Cam, I think this is what I was talking about beforehand. I want, I, we need to make sure they're both at the max. And then I'm going, I'm going to just kind of look right downstream of the dam and I'll right click and I'll plot my time series and I'll plot my depth time series. And so what kind of errors are we looking at? Well, um, it looks like we're, uh, you know, 27 and a half feet versus 31.2 feet. So it, it's a several foot difference directly downstream of the dam. You know, for, you know, for emergency management modeling, emergency management modeling, you're looking at arrival time. But for any sort of planning model, um, if you're going to try to be, you know, computing damages or anything like that, um, then that's a significant difference. And this is definitely a model that should be run at the 250 foot scale. Um, all right. And then another question we asked you is, hey, what do you think about diffusion wave? Um, and so we could do the same thing with diffusion wave. I have a diffusion wave model set up here. And now I've turned off the, uh, I need to make sure that diffusion wave is at max. And um, let's actually do the, well, uh, let's do it with depth first and then go to velocity. And so here we have, um, the diffusion wave with the 250 foot cells. And well, that's interesting. You have a, a similar reduction with diffusion wave as you do with the larger cells. In fact, it would be pretty interesting. I'm, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna turn on the larger cells and diffusion wave and plot those together. Those end up being pretty close. And what's going on here is that you know, the diffusion wave is a, is a simplification, but then the large cells give you numerical dispersion, both of which are, you know, attenuating your peak. And so they're both introducing, um, they're both introducing error. And so, you know, if we, uh, if we also look at the, the difference, we can now kind of switch off of depth and switch to velocity. And view the velocity difference, um, there's going to be some substantial differences there. So 250 feet with the shallow water equations is, is the way we should go here. That, that's not a huge surprise because, you know, what did Gary say about when do we want to use the shallow water flow equations? Well, when there's big changes, when there's, um, sorry, I need to turn that off for us to see what's actually going on. When there's big changes, so there's going to be big velocity changes and lots of like momentum. You know, momentum is something that really, really matters um, at this, in these kind of large changes down here. And so that that's where the velocity, the, the those, uh, those additional components in the shallow water flow equation will really affect things. All right. So that is dam breach with 2D.